By the middle of the following month, the president had definitely decided to attend the Peace Jubilee in Atlanta. I went to Washington again and saw him with the view of getting him to extend his trip to Tuskegee. On his second visit, Mr. Charles W. Hare, a prominent white citizen of Tuskegee, kindly volunteered to accompany me to reinforce my invitation with one from the white people of Tuskegee in the vicinity. Just previous to my going to Washington the second time, the country had been excited and the colored people greatly depressed because of several severe race riots which had occurred at different points in the South. As soon as I saw the president, I perceived that his heart was greatly burdened by the reasons of these race disturb disturbances. Although there were many people waiting to see him, he detained me for some time and discussed the condition and prospects of the race. He remarked several times that he was determined to show his interest and faith in the race, not merely in words, but by acts. When I told him that I thought that at the time, scarcely anything would go farther in having hope and encouragement to the race and in the fact that the president of the nation would be willing to travel 140 miles out of this way to spend a day at a Negro institution, he seemed deeply impressed. While I was with the president, a white citizen of Atlanta, a Democrat, and an ex-slaveholder came into the room and the president asked his opinion as to the wisdom of his going to Tuskegee. Without hesitation, the Atlanta man replied that it was the proper thing for him to do. This opinion was reinforced by the friend of the race, Dr. J.L.M. Curry. The president promised that he would visit our school on the 16th of December. When it came known that the president was going to visit our school, the white citizens of the town of Tuskegee, a mile distant from the school, were as much pleased as were our students and teachers. The white people of the town, including both men and women, began arranging to decorate, to decorate the town and to form themselves into committees for the purpose of cooperating with the officers of our school in order that the distinguished visitor might have fitting reception. I think I never realized before this how much the white people of Tuskegee and vicinity thought of our institution. During the days when we were preparing for the president's reception, dozens of these people came to me and said that they, while they did not want to push themselves into prominence, if there was anything that they could do to help or to relieve me personally, I had but to intimate, intimate it and they would be only too glad to assist. In fact, the thing that touched me most deeply as the visit of the president itself was the deep pride which all class of citizens in Alabama seemed to take in our work. The morning of December 16th brought to the little town of Tuskegee such a crowd as it had never seen before. With the president came Mrs. McKinley and all the cabinet officers but one, and most of them brought their wives or some members of the families. Several prominent generals came, including General Shafter and General Joseph Wheeler, who were recently returned from the Spanish-American War. There was also a host of newspaper correspondents. The Alabama legislature was in session at Montgomery at this time. This body passed a re resolution to adjourn for the purpose of visiting Tuskegee. Just before the arrival of the president's party and legislature arrived, headed by the government and other state officials. The citizens of Tuskegee had decorated the town from the station to the school in a generous manner in order to economize in a matter of time we arranged to have the whole school pass and review before the president. Each student carried a stalk of sugar cane with some open bowls of cotton fastened to the end of it. Following the students, the work of all the departments of the school passed and review displayed on floats drawn by horses, mules, and oxen. On these floats, we tried to exhibit not only the present work of the school, but to show the contrast between the old methods of doing things and the new. As an example, we show the old method of dairying in contrast with the improved methods, the old methods of tilling the soil in contrast with the new, the old methods of cooking and housekeeping in contrast with the new. These floats consumed an hour and a half of time in passing. In his address in our large new chapel, which the students had recently completed, the president said, among other things, to meet you under such pleasant auspices and to have the opportunity of a personal observation of your work is indeed most gratifying. The Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute is ideal in its conception and had already a large and growing reputation in the country and is not unknown abroad. I congratulate all who are associated with this undertaking for the good work which is doing in the education of its students to lead lives of honor and usefulness, thus exalting the race for which it has established. Nowhere, I think, could be a more delightful location have been chosen for this unique educational experiment, 
which has attracted the attention and won the support even of conservative, conservative philanthropists in all sections of the country. To speak of Tuskegee without paying special tribute to Booker T. Washington's genius and perseverance would be impossible. The inception of this noble enterprise was his, and he deserves high credit for it. His was the enthusiasm and enterprise which made its steady progress possible and established in the institution its present high standard of accomplishment. He has worn a worthy reputation as one of the great leaders of his race, widely known and much respected at home and abroad as an accomplished educator, a great orator, and a true philanthropist. The Honorable John D. Long, Secretary of the Navy, said in part, I cannot make a speech today by heart is too full, full of hope, admiration, and pride for my countrymen of both sections and both colors. I am filled with gratitude and admiration for your work, and from the time forward I shall have absolute confidence in your progress and in the solution of the problem in which you are engaged. The problem, I say, has been solved. A picture was presented today which should be upon canvas with the pictures of Washington and Lincoln, and transmitted to future times and generations. A picture which the press of the country should spread broadcast over the land in most dramatic picture, and that picture is this. The President of the United States standing on this platform, on one side the Governor of Alabama, on the other completing a trinity, a representative of a race only a few years ago in bondage. The colored President of the Tuskegee Normal Industrial Institute. God bless the President under the whose majesty such a scene as that is presented to the American people. God bless the state of Alabama, which is showing that it can deal with the problem for itself. God bless the orator, philanthropist, and discipline and disciple of the great master who, if he were on earth, would be doing the same work, Booker T. Washington. Postmaster General Smith closed the address which he made with these words. We have witnessed many spectacles within the last few days, and we have seen the magnificent grandeur and the magnificent achievements of one of the great metropolitan cities of the South. We have seen heroes of the war pass by in procession. We have seen floral parades, but I am sure my colleagues will agree with me in saying that we, were, we have witnessed no spectacle more impressive and more encouraging, more inspiring for our future than which we have witnessed here this morning. Some days after the president returned to Washington, I received a letter which follows. Dear sir, by this mail, I take pleasure in sending you engrossed copies of the souvenir of the visit of the president to your institution. These sheets bear the autographs of the president and the members of the cabinet who accompanied him on the trip. Let me take the opportunity to congratulate you and most heartily and sincerely upon the great success of the exercises provided for an entertainment furnished as under our auspices during the, our visit to Tuskegee. Every feature of the program was perfectly executed and was viewed or participated in with the heartiest satisfaction by every visitor president. The unique exhi exhibition which you gave of your pupils engaged in the industrial vocations was not only artistic, but thoroughly impressive. The tribute paid by the president and his cabinet to your work was none too high and forms of most encouraging augury, I think for the future prosperity of your institution. I cannot close without assuring you that the modest Modesty shown by yourself in the exercises was most favorably commented upon by all members of our party. With best wishes from the continued advance of your most useful and patriotic undertaking, kind personal regards with the compliments of the season, believe me always. Very sincerely yours, John Addison Porter, Secretary to the President. To President Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, 20 years have now passed since I made the first humble effort at Tuskegee in a broken down shanty in an old hen house without owning a dollar's worth of property and with but one teacher and 30 students at the present time, the institution owns 2,300 acres of land, over 700 of which are under cultivation each year entirely by student labor. There are now upon the grounds counting large and small 40 buildings and all except four of these have been almost wholly erected by the labor of our students. While the students are at work upon the land and in erecting buildings, they are taught by competent instructors, the latest methods of agriculture and the trades connected with the building. They are in constant operation at the school in connection with the thorough academic and religious training, 28 industrial departments. All of these teach industries at which our men and women can find immediate employment as soon as they leave the institution. The only difficulty now is that the demand for our graduates from both white and black people in the South is so great that we cannot supply more than one half the persons for whom applications come to us. 
Neither have we the buildings nor the money for current expenses to enable us to admit to the school more than one half the young men and women who apply to us for admission. In our industrial teaching, we keep three things in mind. First, that the students shall be so educated that it shall be enabled to meet conditions as they exist now in the part of the South where he lives. In a word, to be, to be able to do the things which the world wants done. Second, that every student who can graduate from the school shall have enough skill coupled with intelligence and moral character to enable him to make a living for himself and others. Third, to send every graduate out feeling and knowing that labor is dignified and beautiful. To make each one love labor instead of trying to escape it. In addition to the agricultural training, which we give to young men and a training given to our girls and all the usual domestic employments, we now train a number of girls in agriculture each year. These girls are taught gardening, fruit growing, dairying, bee culture, and poultry raising. While the institution is in no sense denominational, we have a department known as the Phelps Hall Bible Training School, in which a number of students are prepared for the ministry and other forms of Christian work, especially work in the country districts, which is equally important. Each one of these students works half of each day at some industry in order to get skill and to love work so that when he goes out from the institution, he's prepared to set the people with whom he goes to labor a proper example in the matter of industry. The value of our property is now over $300,000. If we add to this our endowment fund, which is at present 215,000, the value of the total property is now nearly half a million dollars. Aside from the need for more buildings and more money for current expenses, the endowment fund should be increased to at least 500,000. The annual current expenses are now about 80,000. The greater part of this I collect each year by going from door to door and from house to house. All of our property is free from mortgage and is indebted to the undenominational board of trustees who have the control of this institution. From 30 students, the number has grown to 1,100, coming from 27 states and territories from Africa, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and other foreign countries. In our departments, there are 86 officers and instructors. And if we add the families of our instructors, we have a constant population upon our grounds of not far from 1,400 people. I have often been asked how we keep so large a body of people together and at the same time keep them out of mischief. There are two answers that the men and women who come to us for an education are in earnest and that everybody is kept busy. The following outline of our daily work will testify to this. 5 a.m. rising bell, 5.50 a.m. warning breakfast bell, 6 a.m. breakfast bell, 6.20 breakfast over, 6.20 to 6.50 rooms are clean, 6.50 work bell, 7.30 morning study hour, 8.20 morning school bell, 8.25 inspection of young men's toilet and ranks, 8.40 Devotional exercises in chapel, 8.55, five minutes with the daily news, 9 a.m., classwork begins, 12, classwork closes, 12.15, dinner, 1 p.m., work bell, 1.30 p.m., classwork begins, 3.30 p.m., classwork ends, 5.30 p.m., bell to knock off work, 6 p.m., supper, 7 p.m., evening prayer, 7.30, evening study hours, 8.45 p.m., evening study hour closes, 7, excuse me, 9.20 p.m., Warning, retiring bell, 9.30, retiring bell. We try to keep constantly in mind the fact that the worth of the school is to be judged by its graduates. Counting those who have finished the full course, together with those who have taken enough training to enable them to do reasonably work, good work, we can safely say that at least 3,000 men and women from Tuskegee are now at work in different parts of the South. Men and women who, by their own example, or by direct effort, are showing the masses of our race how to improve their material, educational and moral and religious life. What is equally important, they are exhibiting a degree of common sense and self-control which is causing better relations to exist between the races and is causing a Southern white man to learn to believe in the value of educating the men and women of my race. Aside from this, there is the influence that is constantly being exerted through the mother's meeting and the plantation work conducted by Mrs. Washington. Wherever our graduates go, the changes which soon begin to appear in the buying of land Improving homes, saving money, in education, and in high moral character are remarkable. Whole communities are fast being revolutionized through the instrumentally, instrumentality of these men and women. Ten years ago, I organized at Tuskegee the first Negro Conference. This is our annual gathering, which now brings to the school eight or nine hundred representative men and women of the race who come to spend a day in finding out what the actual industrial, mental, and moral conditions of the people are and informing plans for improvement. 
out from this central Negro conference at Tuskegee have grown numerous state and local com conferences, which are doing the same kind of work. As a result of the influence of these gatherings, one delegate reported to the last annual meeting, me uh, meeting that 10 families in the community had bought and paid for homes. On the day following the annual Negro conference, there is held the workers conference. This is composed of officers and teachers who are engaged in educational work in the larger institutions of the South. The Negro Conference furnishes a rare opportunity for these workers to study the real condition of the rank and file of the people. In the summer of 1900, with the assistance of such prominent colored men as Mr. T. Thomas Fortune, who had always upheld my hands in every effort, I organized the National Negro Business League, which held its first meeting in Boston and brought together for the first time a large number of the colored men and who are engaged in various lines of trade or business in different parts of the United States. 30 states were represented at our first meeting. Out of this national meeting grew state and local business leagues. In addition to looking at the executive side of the work at Tuskegee and raising the greater part of the money for the support of the school, I cannot seem to escape the duty of answering at least a part of the calls which come to me unsought to address Southern white audiences and audiences of my own race, as well as frequent gatherings in the North. As to how much of my time is spent in this way, the following clipping from Buffalo, New York paper will tell. This has reference to an occasion when I spoke before National Education Association in that city. Booker T. Washington, the foremost educator among the colored people of the world, was a very busy man from the time he arrived in the city the other night from the West and registered as an Iroquois, at the Iroquois. He had hardly removed the stains of travel when it was time to partake of supper. Then he held a public lev levy in the parlors of the Iroquois until eight o'clock. During that time, he was greeted by over 200 eminent teachers and educators from all parts of the United States. Shortly after eight o'clock, he was driven to the carriage music hall, and in one hour and a half, he made two ringing addresses to as many as 5,000 people on Negro education. Then Mr. Washington was taken in charge by a delegation of colored citizens, headed by the Reverend Mr. Watkins, and hustled off to a small informal reception arranged in honor of the visitor of the people of his race. Nor can I, in addition to making these addresses, escape the duty of calling the attention of the South and of the country in general through the medium of the press to matters that pertain to the interests of both races. This, for example, I have done in regards to the evil habit of lynching. When the Louisiana State Constitutional Convention was in session, I wrote an open letter to that body pleading for justice for the race. In all such efforts, I have received warm and hearty support from the Southern newspapers, as well as from those in all parts of the country. Despite superficial and temporary signs which might lead one to entertain a contrary opinion, there was never a time when I felt more hopeful for the race than I do at the present. The great human law that in the end recognizes the rewards of merit is everlasting and universal. The outside world does not know, neither can it appreciate the struggle that is constantly growing on in the hearts of both the Southern white people and the former slaves to free themselves from racial prejudice. And while both races are thus struggling, they should have the sympathy and support of the forbearance of the rest of the world. As I write the closing words for this autobiography, I find myself not by design in the city of Richmond, Virginia, the city which only a few decades ago was the capital of the Southern Confederacy and where about 25 years ago, because of my poverty, I slept night after night under a sidewalk. This time I am in Richmond as the guest of the colored people of the city and came at the request to deliver an address last night to both races in the Academy of Music, the largest and finest audience room in the city. This was the first time that the colored people had ever been permitted to use this hall. The day before I came, the city council passed a vote to attend the meeting in a body to hear me speak. The state legislature, including the House of Delegates in the Senate, also passed a unanimous vote to attend in a body, in the presence of hundreds of colored people, many distinguished white citizens, the city council, the state legislature, and state officials, I had delivered my message, which was one of hope and cheer. From the bottom of my heart, I thank both races for this welcome back to the state that gave me birth.